Hey, what's up, Street Talks? It's Eric Kim from the Eric Kim Street Photography Blog. So, for today's presentation, I wanted to talk about street photography projects. So, the reason why I wanted to do this presentation is because when I started off in street photography, it was all about the single image, meaning you'd spend all day, you know, just trying to look for that one great decisive moment where you get that one photo that you upload to Facebook or Flickr and get tons of likes and favorites. And so, so much about this hunting for that one image, hunting for that one image, hunting for that one image. And after a while, what you'll kind of discover when you're just shooting for a quote, quote, single images is that it feels a little bit empty after a while. Like, you know, uh, have you ever had a day when you're out just shooting all day and you're just kind of like, why am I doing this? What does this really mean? Does it say anything deeper? And I think this is where Street Photography Projects really comes in is that uh, when you're working on a project, it's something that's a lot more in depth. It's something that you could work on for a long period of time. And it's also something that you could use your own personal experiences, your own worldviews, and you... Um, with the project, you're able to say something on a deeper emotional human level. So one of the examples I really use when it comes to working on this street photography project and why it's important to work on the street photography project is that if you're writing a book, you can't say that much with uh, you know just one page or one chapter. For uh, a really good story, you need a beginning, a middle, and end. And with stories, they're able to take you through an arc. They, uh, you're able to show an establishing shot, transitioning shots, um, showing a sense of place, kind of the drama and action which happens in the, the story. And of course, there is generally a conclusion. So when it comes to shooting street photography, uh, street photography projects, um, it tends to be more of an intermediate advanced thing, I think, because you know when you're starting off shooting street photography, probably the biggest issue you're going to have is just overcoming your fear of shooting street photography and you know how to compose your photos correctly and how to get close enough. But once you reach that hump and you want something a little bit deeper, I think working on street photography projects is something that will really help elevate you to the next level. So one of the first questions that people have is, you know, what makes essentially a good street photography project? So for me, I think good street photography projects are ones that doesn't always, but generally take a longer period of time. So I think on the short end, I see good projects take at least one or two years. And on the long end, uh, some of the greatest street photography projects ever made in history have taken up to like 10 years. Generally, the rule of thumb is if you think you haven't worked on your project long enough, you probably haven't worked on your project long enough. And uh, a quote that I recently got from Dorothy Lange, um, who I profiled on my blog was, oftentimes photographers don't work their subjects or their themes to exhaustion. So really, really put all your soul, all your energy and all your effort into working on a project. And then at the very end, um, you're able to say, okay, you know, at least I gave this project my all. I attacked it from all different angles. And you know, I tried to really truly extract the essence of what I was trying to say. Um, a lot of people who, uh, a lot of you guys who might not be as familiar with street photography projects, for this presentation, I wanted to show you guys some of the street photography projects which have touched me the most personally, and we could talk a little bit about why I think um, these make great projects. So first of all, The Americans by Rob DeFrank. So if you guys have never heard uh, the guy, this guy named Rob DeFrank uh, in The Americans, uh, if you just Google The Americans, Eric Kim, I have a pretty in-depth um, you know, historical background and review of the book. But anyways, all you have to know is Robert Frank, he was originally born as um, his, his Swiss, and he came to America, and imagine that he came to America in the 50s, and it's kind of like this period of time where America's um, dealing a lot with racism, is dealing with uh, economic struggle, and when you're looking at these, this project, essentially it's his view of America. And when it first came out, people said it was communist, it was anti-American, it was very, very mean, and they're like, oh, this guy is like some poor, demented Swiss guy, and he's got like no soul, blah, blah, blah. And now people look back at this project as saying it's one of the best projects, photography projects ever made. And I think for most street photographers or documentary photographers I know, they kind of consider their Bible. And if you have the opportunity, I'd highly recommend purchasing a copy of the book. But what I think makes this a great project is that it's a very subjective view of America. And... The, the project has so much different symbolism uh, behind it. Uh, common themes you'll see behind the, the project is, of course, the American flag, uh, decay, kind of socioeconomic decline, um, kind of the sense of loneliness, the sense of mel melancholy, a sense of depression. And also through the project, you'll see um, 
pretty much how he sees race inequality. And to put it lightly, he doesn't really see America in a very favorable uh, way. And I think this is also another important thing when you're working on the street photography project is that no one doesn't have to be quote quote objective because ultimately reality is colored through the lens in which you see the world and the way you see the world is based on your personal experiences and your own subjective view. Therefore, know that the best street photography projects, I think, are the ones that are very personal, the ones that you know, your view of the world is unique from the, the world view of others. So let's kind of take a look through some of these images. So this is the, the title of the Americans. And take a look at the image and think to yourself, what are some aspects that interest you? So one of the things that you might notice, um, if you look in the center of the frame, uh, who's sitting in the front center? So you have this uh, young white boy. Uh, he's dressed up really well. He's wearing uh, kind of like a suit. He's got a bow tie. Behind is presumably his sister, who looks like she's about to cry. And they, they both feel very, very tense. And if you look in the beginning, uh, you look in the front of the, bu the bus, you know, you have the white people sitting in the front. In the back of the bus, who do you have sitting? Yeah, black people. So during this time uh, was a time of segregation. So I think what Robert Frank is really trying to say through this photo is um, kind of this racial inequality and this divide. And interestingly enough, if you look at the, the right side of the frame, the African-American male, his you know, kind of hollowed out look, uh, looking at um, Robert Frank, almost mirrors that of the boy. And they're in to two totally different positions in life, but he still kind of had the sense of sadness of lo loneliness of longing and it's it's a really strong image that also you know attacks this kind of uh, racial inequality so when you look at this image um you know first of all one of the things you always want to think about uh, in a project is symbolism so what is the the symbol that you see here in this image yep you got it it's the the big old american flag in the center uh the top of the frame uh take a look at the person in the left side of the frame what kind of sense of emotion or mood do you get from that person? If you're thinking about this anything the way that I did, the person is kind of looking out the window with kind of a sense of loneliness, of long longing, and kind of the sense of maybe being scared or afraid of the outside world. And the, in the right side of the frame, you have someone's head almost decapitated by the American flag. And oftentimes when you can't see people's faces in a photograph, it makes it a little bit more mysterious and has a very interesting hand gesture as well. And the interesting thing about this, this image, if you look behind the scenes, so these are the, the contact sheets of uh, the Americans. And if you want uh, an excellent book to learn more about the, the Americans and see all his contact sheets, it's I believe it's uh, Robert Frank uh, Looking In. It was published by Steidel about a year or two ago. It might be kind of expensive now, but if you're able to find your hands on a secondhand copy, it's definitely worth a look. So... One of the important things, this is just street photography in general, is that you want to stay with the scene and you want to keep working the scene. So if you look at the first uh, four frames on the top of the frame, you could see that he saw, he saw, he's looking up, he sees the American flag, he takes about four images, then he goes back down to the street, takes a few more images, and then he looks up again and then takes another shot. And it's that very shot which makes the ultimate image, which is this image. And so I think one of the lessons we could learn from Robert Frank is that once you think you've got the shot, don't move on too quickly. Sometimes it's good to linger around and wait and see if there's even a better shot to be taken. So you can see the close-up of the shot. Uh, another very famous image from Robert Frank's American. So when you look at this image, first of all, what's weird about the image? <laughs> so we're in a, a men's bathroom or toilet and you don't see a lot of this anymore. Um, here's a man getting a shoe shine in a toilet. Not exactly the most sanitary place to, to get a shoe shine. And one of the things that I always look for, um, which makes a great street photograph in general or a project, is strong emotions. And the way you can capture strong emotions are often through hand gestures. So here's a man getting a shoe shined, and he's using his right hand to kind of cover his face. And there's obviously this, this power dynamic between the guy getting his shoe shined and the guy on the bottom. And it's a kind of a very, once again, a sad, melancholy, isolating image. In terms of the composition, if you draw, uh, if you drew a red line from the bottom right side of the frame, using tracing the the direction of the urinals, it points directly to the man. And 
also some all, some of the small compositional details is if you take a look at the two um, diagonal brooms, they almost mimic the direction of the, the man sitting down. This is a classic photo, of course. Uh, you can't have a project of America without um, a cowboy and a lighting up a cigarette. So he almost looks kind of like a Levi's uh, ad. And one of the interesting things about street photography is that people always say that, oh, you know, street photography always has to be candid. You know, if people don't notice you or if people see you taking their photo, it's not a street photograph. Or if you ask for, ask for permission, it's not a street photograph, whatever. Personally, to me, that doesn't bother me as much. I think it could be a street photograph if it's posed, not posed. Uh, to me, the more interesting question is if it's an emotional photo, if it's a photo that touches me, if it's a photo that um, I could connect with on a human basis. And so if you take a look at this image, one of the questions I want to ask you is, do you think this is a posed photo or a candid photo? So, drum roll please. Um, actually, you can't see it based on the contact sheets, but essentially this photo is actually um, a posed photo, meaning it was shot with the, the subject's intent. I don't really know the specifics behind um, how Robert Frank took the image, but if you look at his contact sheets, um, I didn't include it all here, but if you look in the book, essentially he's talking with the cowboy and the cowboy's interacting with him. And, you know, later on he gets this image. So pretty much what probably happened was he saw a cowboy in the street, started chatting up with him. He might have said, hey, you know, pretend like I'm not here. Take a light, your cigarette, let me get a shot. Or maybe the, the cowboy just kind of ignored Rob Frank and kind of went on to his business and started smoking up. But essentially the point is, I think this idea of being a quote, quote, invisible street photographer is kind of a myth. I mean, you're walking around in a public place, you got a camera either around your neck or in your hand. Um, you're gonna impede the flow of traffic. People are gonna see you walking and stuff like that. So I think kind of being overrated, um, being invisible in street photography is a bit overrated. Um, sometimes inserting yourself into your scenes will make more emotional images, in which I think makes this a great photo once again. Um, a strong symbol of an American cowboy, the hand gesture of him the moment he's about to uh, smoke. Another interesting thing you go see in um, Robert Frank's Americans is generally, you know, I'm kind of a stickler when it comes to cropping. I, I generally recommend people try not to crop, but uh, most of Robert Frank's photos are actually uh, cropped, heavily cropped. He's even taken some photos in the project and taken horizontal shots and made them vertical. Um, the, the photo that comes to mind is um, there's a two there's a rich couple um, at a ball. The original image is uh, a, a horizontal shot. It's cropped it vertical. So essentially, I think, you know, cropping is fine. I mean, just try to do it to make a better image that will talk to uh, your subjects and try to keep the aspect ratio consistent. So if you look at this image where you see the little blue crayon marks, that's essentially how Rob Frank cropped the image. This is also one of Robert Frank's most famous images. So take a look at the woman and the expression on her face. So kind of what is the emotion, the mood, the thoughts of this woman? So she's kind of hunched over. Her eyes are kind of a glazed. Um, on the far right of the frame, you see a silhouette of who? Kind of this mysterious, perhaps bald man. You can see a little of the outline of his spectacles. Kind of, he's like a phantom, almost moving towards her. In the far left, you actually have a woman with um, what I think are you know, fancy white furs draped around her neck. And what is the, the place of this photo? So if it's kind of hard to tell, it's inside an elevator. And she's actually the elevator girl. Um, you know, I wasn't around back then, but apparently uh, you, know, you would actually have people pushing the, the buttons to take you to different floors. And, you know, Another strategy you could do when you're shooting street photography is after you've taken a photo, if it's with permission or at, without permission, is that you can, you know, stay with your subject afterward. So if you look at the contact sheets, you could see how many frames it's taken. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, about 15 shots. And if you see a good scene, don't just take one photo and move on. Uh, really stay with the scene and work the scene. And if you're shooting digital, there's essentially no upper limit in terms of how many photos you could take. So I would say try to work the scene and take as many photos as humanly possible. If you're shooting on film, um, you know, same thing, you know, 
Be more selective, perhaps, with the scenes you photograph. But when you do see an interesting scene, really, really work the scene. So in the in this photo, you can see in the you know about four photos, five photos in, he gets the image. But then at the very end, you know, he's probably chatting up this uh, you know this elevator girl and has her pose for her uh, pose for him at the end. So sometimes you don't know um, what's going to make the best image, and I think you know especially when you're working with film you're a little bit less certain. So I think you, you you keep working the scene, working the scene, working the scene. This is why I'm also anti quote, quote, chimping is when you look at the back of your LCD screen after you made an image because that fools you into thinking you've got the image, whereas in reality, you might not. So stick with the scene. And yeah, perhaps even the end, ask them to pose for you. You never know if it's going to make a good photo or not. So another photograph uh, by Robert Frank is this photo. Um, so take a look at this image and don't just say what it is, say what it looks like. I think the best photos aren't the ones that are descriptive saying this is what it is. Um, I think the best photos are open photos. So there are quote, quote, open photos and closed photos. Do you know what the difference between an open photo and a closed photo is? Take a guess, ponder it for a second. So an open photo tends to generally be more open-ended. Um, an open photo is much more engaging because it invites the viewer to make up his or her own little story uh, about the photograph. And it, it's much more interesting because it kind of pause, reflects, like, hey, that, that's what this kind of looks like. Whereas closed photo is, it is what it is. You know, it's not that interesting. Um, so to me, this is an open photo because in reality, we probably know it's a car draped with you know, the things that protect cars, the, the car covers but to me what it looks like is it almost looks like a body bag you know when you know if, if you ever watch some sort of fbi drama tv show after someone gets gunned down um, the paramedics come and they take that drape and they put it over the dead body so maybe and this might be a symbolism of like uh, the death of the american automobile or some sort of death of some sort of american values but at the same time, it's a beautiful photograph in the sense that he's photographed this when the light's really, really nice and it, it almost glows and it feels very America because you have the palm trees in the background. It feels very L.A. So, you know, when you're out shooting street photography, it's, it's often hard to create open photos when you're shooting. But often this happens during the editing process, uh, meaning when you're out shooting, shoot from the gut, just shoot for whatever interests you don't become too intellectual about it. But when you go home and you look at your, uh, you know, you either look at your images on Lightroom or whatever software you use, then you could really sit down and edit your shots, meaning choose your best images based on which one you think will be more engaging to the viewer. So once again, um, the better photos tend to be open photos rather than closed photos. Um, so try to create more open-ended photos that invite the viewer to you know, play along essentially. Another famous photo by Robert Frank. A little bit of sense of surrealism. You have this guy with uh, the horn blocking his face. And one interesting thing is just kind of how he's framed the image. That if you see a little bit on the right side of the original frame, you can see a little bit of this woman's face. And on the left side, you can see a little bit of the man. But he's purposely cut it at, um, at all remnants of their faces because if you had the woman's face in the right side of the frame, I think it'd be a little bit distracting. It would take away from this guy's... Um, big old trombone in the center and it kind of adds to this effect um, also the the thing is when you're shooting with a rangefinder um robert frank shot these on a leica i believe and you can't really see the edges of a frame that well i would say my general rule of thumb when it comes to cropping is try not to crop more than five or ten percent of the frame or else i think it, ge it generally uh, makes you a sloppier and lazier street photographer when you're out shooting i think it's best to try to get the camera try to get your photos as good as you can quote, quote, in camera. But if you're not able to do that, you know, a little bit of crop at the sides doesn't, doesn't hurt. Another another funny photo, uh, a bunch of stern old men and what's the cherry on top? <laughs> and what I like to call the quote, quote, cherry on top is that one small little detail which kind of makes the photo. So to me, it's the guy on the far right. <laughs> it looks like he's blowing a kiss and closing his eyes. It's quite cute. But if you actually look at the, the original image, you can see how he's kind of cropped out the, far, uh, the man in the far right to accentuate this man here. Um, so that that's it for Robert Frank's uh, The Americans. Um, if you want to learn more about Robert Frank's The Americans, you could just go on the Googles and search 
uh, Eric, Kim, Robert, Frank. Yeah, and I have this super long article on Robert Frank and the Americans um, that you could kind of learn more about. But anyways, uh, going back to the presentation. So uh, this is the next project that um, I want to, to describe. So this is a, a project by British photographer Martin Parr. His, uh, his, I think he's currently the, the president of Magnum, uh, the big photo agency, the most prestigious photographers all around the world. And he's really famous for you, uh, shooting street photography in color. And he doesn't call himself a street photographer, nor did Robert Frank or most photographers out there. But I think the concept of going out to a public place and photographing strangers without their permission, I mean, essentially is kind of the ethos of street photography. And what I really love about Martin Parr's photos is that his photos aren't just kind of funny photos. They just kind of look like funny, glossy, uh, colorful photos on the outside. But deep down, he kind of provides a lot of social commentary and critique. And therefore, his photos aren't just, you know, nicely composed photos. But they really, he has something to say about humanity. And this is a project titled, quote, quote, Small World. And I, I love all his titles. They're all very clever. And he does a project on tourism. And when you look through the photos, you could kind of get a sense of how he feels about tourism. And I'm not going to spoil it quite yet, but we'll, let's take a look at the images. All right. So what do you find interesting about this image? The first thing that probably comes to your mind is like, oh, my God, like this guy in his super short shorts. Um, oh, my God, is that like? A video camera that he's holding it's like wow this is so this is so dated right was this like maybe 90s right early 90s or so but what i really want you to examine is kind of think to yourself okay so who's sitting on top and who's on bottom kind of leading this guy along so you have a guy on the top of the frame who is uh, presumably um you know somewhat of a privileged um white middle class maybe upper middle class maybe rich uh white man on the bottom you have uh, a local essentially acting as his guide and you know we might have seen this scene somewhere in the past but to me what this says is kind of this power dynamic between um uh, white people and indigenous populations in um, developing third world countries and so the guy in the bottom he's kind of like his servant and of course he's getting paid and stuff like that but um, I think oftentimes when you're visiting places that are you know, really, really beautiful and really popular in tourism, the locals kind of get trapped into being simply just tour guides and their entire economy is totally dependent on tourism, which I mean, and this is why it's open to interpretation is that like um, if you're more of a liberal left wing guy like me, you might think it's like, oh, you know, Tourism is like you know, hurting these people and their economies, their families, making them very fragile, blah, blah. Or, you know, on the other hand, you know, it might be a good thing is that like um, tourism is helping these people who otherwise wouldn't have money to feed, support and feed their families. So there's no right or wrong answer. But once again, you use your own prejudices, you use your own um, uh, philosophies, your own political leanings to interpret images and also the world. Um, if you look at this next image. So where are we? In Africa, if you guys have ever traveled to a developing country, um, you know, I haven't, I've never been to Africa, but I've been to India several times. And you often have a lot of uh, locals or kids kind of running up to you, trying to sell you stuff. And so take a look at this woman in the center and what's, what's kind of the expression on her face. So to me, she looks a little bit out of place, a bit frazzled, a little bit overwhelmed. She's already, uh, if you look over her left arm, what has she already bought? So it looks like she's already bought a drum and you know, that's kind of the worst thing is that once you've already bought something, people keep just trying to sell you stuff. And it looks like she might be taking out her wallet about to pay for something else. But it just kind of, once again, talks about, I think, the the social economic struggle or the tension between tourists and local. <laughs> this is classic, right? <laughs> so who are they calling? No, they're just... Uh, they're using the, the phones as uh, the tour guides, right? <laughs> so essentially, we're here in a museum and... You know, you have this two couple just to looking totally out of place. Um, to me, what I love about the photos are the small details. Um, the woman holding her glasses in her hand, camera on her neck, big old fanny pack. Gotta love that. And both of them just look so out of place. Um, and one of the criticisms that 
Martin Parr has um, gets about his photography is that he's kind of making fun of people. I mean, honestly, I don't know what his ultimate intention is, uh, and I don't think it really matters, but I think it just kind of, to me, what it says is that tourism could just be so tacky. So, where are we? <laughs> yep, we're in Paris. And is he the first guy to have ta ever taken that photo? Um, if you've ever been to the Eiffel Tower, essentially you stand in the center and you just take a photo looking up and there's all these nice converging lines, whatever. But oftentimes what makes good photo is, you know, what I make, think makes this image is, you know, the couple in the background embracing each other. So where are we? Are we in Egypt? <laughs> it's like, oh man, Eric, you're, you're an idiot. No, so we're in Las Vegas, right? Um, an interesting thing you'll notice about this project is he shot this all um, on medium format uh, with a flash, with super saturated film. That's why he has this kind of look. And the interesting thing about when you're working on a project is often the camera, the lens, the film, and the quote, quote, look influences the, the, the aesthetic of the project. And it also is important because it changes the viewer's perception of it. So he, here he is doing a project on tourism using super high saturated film that makes it look like cheesy, glossy posters that you see that like stock images of people trying to travel. But at the same time, they're very kind of a little bit darker and more cynical. And therefore, uh, if you're working on a street photography project that is really dark and emotional, you know, perhaps gritty black and white film might be a better look for you. Or if you're trying to work on a happier project, um, vibrant colors might be better. But these are, of course, just very generalizations. Um, sometimes doing the exact opposite is that you could photograph very, very dark subject matter, but using a super high saturated, quote, quote, happy look to kind of create some sort of juxtaposition between um, the, the two emotions. So just really think carefully about whether you decide to shoot your projects in black and white color. Um, I have seen a few projects that have been shot both in black and white and color. Todd Heidel comes to mind. But I think for 99.9% .9 of photographers, and especially if you're a street photographer starting off working on a project, I don't recommend mixing color and black and white. I recommend just sticking in all in black and white or in all in color. You could also think about like a film. Generally, movie directors shoot the whole thing in black and white or the whole thing in black and white. Otherwise, it's a little bit jarring to, you know, some of the movies in color, some of it's in black and white, and it's just kind of a bit distracting. But, um, you know, essentially by using the flash in these images, he kind of creates this cardboard cutout look um, that the exposure on his subjects are the same as the subjects in the background. So uh, another another funny photo. So are we, where are we right now? Yep, we're at the, the Mayan temples. And, you know, also one thing I love about Martin Parr is his use of colors. So you have this bright pink magenta of the, the tourist. And in the background, you have that really saturated blue sky and a little bit of that green. And the composition is spot on, too. So uh, sometimes if you're traveling to touristy places, uh, one of the rules of thumbs that I learned is that wherever you which, whatever direction you see tourists shooting, shoot the exact opposite direction <laughs> to make, make better images. Uh, where are we now? Yep, we're at Machu Picchu. And you have all these little people wearing these little, um, you know, outfits and to me they look like pac-man ghosts and they just they just look so silly and out of place so i mean if you're looking through his images you know what do you think of martin parr's view on tourism and tourists probably doesn't look too highly or favorably upon them <laughs> so another another classic you know just kind of this funny juxtaposition between two two of the people do you would you prefer the person on the right or the person on the left I don't know about you, but I have a thing for Europeans and Speedos. <laughs> um, also, once again, it's kind of a, a very weird and odd image. And Martin Parr has a knack for catching people doing strange things. And once again, going back to the thing, is he making fun of them or not? I don't know. It's just um, it's your interpretation, ultimately. <laughs> so what are we doing here? We're doing a little bit of air charades kind of you know, holding up the Leaning Tower of Pisa, right? So sometimes when you're shooting, even taking a step to the left or the right and changing the perspective can totally change the image. So where are we now? So if you haven't guessed, we're in the real Egypt. And once again, having this guy with boy in the back of his head is essentially what makes the image. 
And where are we now? If you guys haven't guessed, we're actually in um, we're in Japan. And one of the things I want you to think about is what makes this photo so weird or odd or strange? So if you guys haven't understood this image yet, it's an indoor pool, meaning, you know, it's a fake beach. Funny story, literally like a few miles the other way, there's a real beach and apparently it's like empty and deserted. What makes, what do you think he's trying to say about um, people, society, modern, uh, the modern world and modern people? So another question you might think is, what is the benefit of going to a real beach, a quote, quote, real beach or the disadvantages of going to a real beach? Um, so think about the disadvantages like, oh, it's so sunny, you get sunburned, you know, the water's so salty, there's jellyfish, blah, blah, blah. But to me, I mean, that's essentially what makes the beach enjoyable is that the fact that it's real world, it's real nature. But I think what Martin Parr is trying to say through this image is nowadays, um, as human beings, we're so sanitized. You know, we like things nice and safe. We don't like to take risks. We don't like to kind of go out on a limb. So really thinking about this kind of image is, you know, it's kind of sad. Like, I feel like everything in our modern lives is just kind of wrapped with plastic. And, you know, so if you see through this entire series, he's, he's making kind of this negative outlook on tourism. And, you know, people might say, oh, that's so mean of you because, you know, some people who are tourists, they're not all bad people, blah, blah. But once again, this is just Martin Parr's view of the world. And I think when you, if you want to create a really strong um, street photography project, you want to be very opinionated. You don't want to be, the worst thing you could do uh, as as a photographer or working on a project is to make a boring project. Generally, boring projects are when you try to please everybody. I think it's Bill Cosby who said, you know, I don't know what the secret to success is, but I know what the sec secret to failure is. The secret to failure is trying to please everybody. So know that if you work on a really good project or a really strong series, you're going to have a lot of critics. If anything, uh, I think you should be able to count the success or the greatness of your project by seeing how much critics you have. If you have a project and nobody criticizes it, it probably means that it's just not interesting enough to evoke different emotions in people, which I think emotion is one of the strongest things in a project. So another project, Istanbul by Alex Webb. So have you guys ever heard of Alex Webb? Uh, no. So if you haven't heard of Alex Webb, also a magnet photographer, probably one of the best living street photographers. Um, his book, The Suffering of Light is, in my opinion, Definitely the top three color street photography books. And what Alex Webb's st signature style is that he creates lots of different layers and lots of different colors. And his photos are very complex. It's almost like he's trying to shove all these things into a frame. And it's always on the edge of being too much, but it isn't quite yet. And, you know, his photos, uh, you know, he's done different projects all around the world. Um, his Istanbul book is in my opinion, one of the best. Um, also, he's done some great work in Cuba. He's done some great work in uh, Mexico. And one one of the different ways you can work on a street photography project is kind of work on a quote, quote, sense of place, meaning you go to a place and you photograph it over many times. Generally, these kind of projects tend to be a little bit more difficult if you're traveling because let's say you go to Istanbul for a weekend or a week. You're not going to be able to really create a strong body of work in just a week. I mean, once again, great projects take years, months, uh, perhaps even a decade. So um, don't always think that when you're working on a project that shows a sense of place, it has to be somewhere foreign and exotic. Oftentimes, the best projects are in your own backyard. So maybe photographing your own town, your own city is a good way to kind of get a sense of place and a sense of emotion. So one of my favorite photos from the book. So take a look at the image and see how it makes you feel. So you have a kid here eating his cotton candy. And what's kind of the look on his face? He's a little bit pensive, a little bit, you know, scared. And it doesn't help, of course, that in the background, you have two little strangers um, you know, creepily uh, approaching towards him. And often when you look at Alex Webb's photos, uh, what makes them really great is the small details in the background. And to me, what I love about this photograph is also the colors, the, the juxtaposition between the greens and the reds. So um, there's that and also the chain on the top makes it feel a little bit more sinister as well. Uh, one of Alex Webb's famous, uh, most famous images um, of a barber shop. And one thing I really love about this image is the fact that you don't know which way is in, which way is out. I don't know if this really says anything about Istanbul or the culture there, but 
um, visually, graphically, it's very complex. You know, you have um, when you're kind of creating these kind of images, um, one of the, the, the uh, key secrets is try not to have your subjects overlap, meaning leave a little bit of white space around each of the subjects. And one of the interesting things, so he's, he's, here uh, Alex Webb shooting Kodachrome film on his like um, 35 mil. I think he's only shooting ISO like 64 perhaps. Guess how many rolls of film he shot for the scene? He shot, I believe, um, 10 rolls of film, meaning he worked this scene and he took 360 photographs in this one scene. Mind you, on film, this actually costs some money. So one of the questions you want to ask yourself uh, as a street photographer is when you're working on a project, you're trying to make an image, how bad do you want it? How bad are you willing to stick around with your subject and work the scene and try to get the closest thing to what you think is a perfect image? And of course, this varies for everybody, but you know, think to yourself, you're only as good as you want to be. And the, the difference between mediocre street photographers and great street photographers is that mediocre photo street photographers, I think, only take one or two shots and leave. The really great, the really obsessive street photographers will take um, 10, 20, 30, 40, 500, I don't know, however, however many photos. I think when in doubt, shoot more. And once again, with digital, there's no downside of taking extra shots. So I think it's generally better to overshoot a scene than undershoot a scene. So oftentimes Alex Webb's photos are very complex and um, you know multiple layers and stuff like that. But I think often his strongest images are his simple images. And I think at the end of the day, less is more and simplicity is the ultimate sophistication said by uh, Leonardo da Vinci. So take a look at this image and what are some of the compositional elements you see here? So first of all, think to yourself, do you see a curve? Yep, you probably see the curve um, in the left side of the frame. And you also have the leading line of the rail pointing to the man's face. And his right in the corner, which is perfect. And his, look at the way he's holding his hands and the way he feels pensive. And also he's kind of photographed this during quote, quote, blue hour. So you kind of have this uh, slightly green color and you have this off blue in the background. So it really gives you a sense of mood. And, you know, just think about what's on his mind. And I talked earlier about open photos versus closed photos. So do you think this is an open photo or a closed photo? Yep, it's it's an open photo in the sense that it's open ended. You don't really know what's on his mind, and you can interpret however you uh, you want. And it's like you know, is he thinking about his family? Is he thinking about his wife? Is he thinking about finances? About his life forward or backwards? And I think once uh, the pensiveness is in his crossed legs and his his two fingers linking that way. Another great tip when you're working on street photos, if you want to create more edgy compositions, is putting your focus in the background, right? So if you're shooting with a camera, so pre-focusing your lens to let's say five or 10 meters and shooting what, um, getting the background really, really sharp and then having a figure in the extreme foreground being a little bit blurry and out of focus. And what it does is it creates a sense of um, depth to the photos. And you know, if you want to create multiple subject images, generally the, the golden number is three. So you have this kid's face in the extreme foreground, the bottom left corner, a kid uh, swinging off the thing at the top. And of course, you have the, the ship that looks like it's sinking. I, I don't actually know the story behind this photograph, but it's kind of a very strange image. But all these three image uh, parts of the frame that fill it kind of create the sense of tension and um, kind of just <laughs> like what is going on kind of thing. So once again, take a look at the depth in this photo. So who's closest to us in the frame? Yeah, so you have a couple on the far, uh, the far right of the frame um, kind of talking and discussing. And then you have the mosque in the background. Um, and it kind of just draws your eyes through the frame. And it tells, I think, um, it's an open photo is that, you know, he's caught this couple having some sort of conversation. You don't know what they're talking about, but, you know, you could make up your own little story uh, in your head. And I think the best three photos are the ones that tell stories or perhaps suggest stories, meaning, you know, it's an open photo that you could create your own little interpretation. So look at this photo and kind of get a sense of what the emotion or the mood of this photograph is. So you kind of have this man hunched over. He's got his elbow on the counter and his two fingers pressed against his forehead. And he's kind of looking out into the distance and he's smoking a cigarette. And once again, uh, a good way to know what people's emotions are is literally mimic their hand gesture. So in this photograph, if you put your elbow on a table and push your fingers against your forehead, 
I'm just kind of looking at blankly, holding a cigarette. You're kind of lost in thought. You're feeling a little bit, um, you know, unsure, a little bit uncertain, maybe a little bit worried or afraid or sad. And here in the back, and you know, so maybe he's a store owner just waiting for customers to come in. But in the background, you have two men, two men who are essentially walking by, totally ignoring him. So this is just my interpretation of the photo. You can interpret however you like. But another great thing about Alex Webb's photos is the fact that not, not only does he capture really, really great light, but he captures really, really great colors. Um, and colors and light are the two biggest things in his photographs. And if you look at the majority of his photos, he either shoots it when the light's really good. So either really, really early, either sunrise or sunset. And apparently this is why I hear the way he shoots is that, you know, Alex Webb would go very early, catch the morning light. During the day, kind of take a nap, kind of chill, hang out. And essentially during the day, he's kind of scouting for locations. But then in the evening, um, when the, the sun starts to set, that's when he starts shooting like crazy. So if you want to be a more efficient street photographer with your time, those are the two best times to shoot. Either early morning, personally, I'm too lazy. I can't wake up early, so I'll shoot in the, the sun uh, sunset. But when the sun is setting, really, really use that time and don't don't waste it to make images. I, th I think this is actually one of my favorite photos is the fact that um, I think it has strong symbolism. So first of all, what's going on the... What's, what's, what's going on is the first question you want to ask yourself. So we have this woman, you know, biting <laughs> the, the wings of, uh, what kind of bird is that? A dove? And she's not just trying to eat it, but she's clipping the wings. And by clipping the wings, the, the doves can't fly away. And how, how could you interpret this symbolically? So for me, clipping the wings means that it can't fly away. And the dove is a symbol of what? Kind of peace, freedom, being able to fly away, purity. So maybe this is some sort of a way to be um, symbolic against the, the Turkish government that they're kind of oppressing the people, not allowing them to be free and stuff like that. And there's always been really a lot of po uh, political issues in Turkey as well, uh, and currently as well. So... Whether or not the viewer kind of comes up to this interpretation or not is not ultimately up to you, the photographer. But um, once again, these are certain things you should think about, uh, at least when you're putting together and editing a, uh, a project. Another great photograph. Um, here you have a man essentially running away. And this is what a lot of street photographers are now called the quote-unquote fishing technique, meaning you see a good background, you see good light, you see a good background on composition, whatever. You pre-frame your, your scene, and then you just wait for someone to, to run into the photograph. So uh, essentially, I think that's how you made the image. Another interesting thing about this photograph is look at all the directions people are looking and the hand gestures, the light, how he's spaced the heads equi uh, equidistant from one another. And to me, it's kind of a quote-unquote nothing photo in the sense that it doesn't really say anything. So it doesn't have the strongest emotion per se, but it does, I think, show kind of a sense of diversity and kind of a sense of movement. In terms of the composition, you have kind of a nice circle um, in the direction of people's heads, their gestures and stuff like that. Another great compositional technique that Alex Webb utilizes a lot in street photography is our triangles. So can you see the triangle here? If you can't see it, um, essentially just look at the guy in the foreground, the guy in the bottom left corner and the top left corner. And it's almost like a still from a movie is that you have all these strange elements. So you have the telephone booth, you have an old guy with the glasses and mustache in the background, then you have the guy in the top with a gun. So <laughs> to me, maybe like the, the guy in the bottom right corner, he also has a suspicious look on his face. He calls for some sort of like drug heist or stuff like that or trying to rob a bank, I don't know. And there's a guy in the top left corner who's like a sniper just kind of looking at. But... If it wasn't for all three of these guys in the photograph, it wouldn't complete the triangle composition and make as strong as the image. And no, I think ultimately makes this a strong image is kind of the sense of mystery of darkness and um, stuff like that. All right, so that concludes uh, Alex Webb's uh, Istanbul series. The last series I wanted, um, the last project I want to talk to you guys about is Gypsies. It's my personal favorite project, and it's made by Joseph Kudelka. Joseph Kudelka is currently in his 70s and He's literally not held a job, I think, the last 50 years. He's one of those very few individuals in the world that has the courage to live his life exactly the way he wanted to, not by anyone else's standards, but by his. And 
for this project, he traveled with, uh, you know, the Roma people, which is the political, politically correct term for gypsies or traveler. Um, but for um, this project, he essentially traveled with the Roma people um, all throughout Eastern Europe. And he lived with them. He drank with them. He became a part of their lives. And he photographed it for over 10 years. So he wasn't just like an outsider coming in and like, hey, you guys are a bunch of, you know, interesting gypsies. Let me just photograph you. But rather, he's really befriended them. And what you could see through the series is that he he's really kind of built up a sense of trust and intimacy. He's, he's not an outsider looking in. He's literally an insider. An interesting anecdote is that apparently when he... Um, you know, he was, he was living with his people. He was just like, um, he was so poor that all he, his only possession was a camera and a sleeping bag. And he'd sleep on the grounds of um, the Roma people. And apparently he was so poor that even the Roma people felt bad for him to get a sense of, uh, you know, how he lived his life. But essentially, uh, most of the photos are taken with permission. And, you know, perhaps it's not quote, quote, street photography in the sense that, you know, He's not just like photographing this in a public place. It's more of a documentary series. But I think at the end of the day, we could kind of get a lot of inspiration from him because, you know, the sense of grittiness from the photos, the sense of the, the intimacy of the, pro, uh, the project. And also, you know, Kudelka was essentially a street photographer that he, he was a constant traveler and, you know, photographed a lot of uh, just candid scenes as well. And most of those photos you could see in Exiles, but I still think it's a great project if you kind of have a more documentary bent inside you is that rather than just wandering around in a public place, photographing what interests you and somehow stringing it together afterwards, perhaps if there's a certain community or of a certain group of people whose lives you want to document, gypsies could be a good one um, to do that. So <laughs> take a look at this image. So um, first of all, in terms of the composition, do you see the triangle? Yep. If you connect all three of these boys and make a nice triangle, and kind of what is the story that, you know, what do they look like? So in terms of what they look like, to me, they look like little skeleton scarecrows. And in terms of what's going on, um, when I was a kid, I've done this, like you kind of, I don't think that they're necessarily emaciated um, perhaps, but like if you're, if you're, um, uh, when I was a young boy growing up, like I would do this, like I would suck in my stomach really, really thin until my, my ribs suck out and I would just kind of, hold it out so it's kind of this odd image where here are these kids trying to like flex and look macho but at the same time they kind of look like weak emaciated skeletons and um but at the same time it's you know it's an it's a fascinating image and he's i don't know exactly how he's photographed the image but in reality he's probably posed him that way he's like hey kid you stand there you stand there uh, you stand there and the way i think i i know that he's um posed a lot of these images the fact that this triangle composition comes over and over again in his uh, Gypsy series. So it's probably something he's doing intentionally. And in the background, you have all these other kids looking over. One of them looks like a girl. So perhaps there's this kind of tension between uh, these young boys trying to become men and also these young girls looking on. Um, a lot of Kudelka's photos are also very quite simple. And one thing which I really love about his image is the fact that how emotional and moody they are. And, um, here is here's a photo of a, like a pretty, you know, um, thin looking horse, and the the way that the man's crouched down and gesturing at the horse and looking at it, it almost looks like he's having this very personal connection and communication with this horse. Um, is this an open photo or a close photo? Open. Another strong portrait. Um, he's taken of people inside their homes. Just take away that the take a look at the expressions of their face the way he's gone really close. And the interesting thing about this project, he shot this all on some sort of old SLR. I'm not exactly sure what camera it was, but he shot these on a 24 millimeter lens, meaning he got really, really close to his subjects. And the effect of shooting with a wide angle lens and getting close to your subjects is the fact that it feels like you're really, really there. So look at the woman, the way she's holding her fingers and looking at you um, and the way that the man's putting her his hands over her shoulders. And it kind of has that somber, emotional mood to it. Here's another lovely image here. Um, in terms of the perspective, Kudaka's crotch on very, very low. And, you know, they're playing music inside a house. And in the background, you see this painting of Jesus and Mary. And the cherry on top is you can see the couple dancing in the mirror that's reflected. And also a small detail, which I love, is the little light bulb in the top left side of the frame. This is one of my favorite photos. I think, I think a, 
an just like an average photographer would or a mediocre photographer would just take a you know a group photo of the entire family that's posed. But here Kudelka's taken a step back and he's photographed the chair, the family, um, the little thing on the ceiling, and also the man on the far right. And I think it's the man on the far right with his hands on his hips, looking over kind of suspiciously. And, you know, it's, it's kind of a... <laughs> I think it's kind of a happy photo in the sense that you have this, this family in the background and you have this man in the far right. It's kind of like your grumpy older uncle just kind of looking cautiously at you. But the way he kind of composes his images is absolutely beautiful as well. Here's another photograph. Um, so take a look at this image and what's, what's interesting or weird about this photo? So for me, um, here you have a man kind of sitting down and in his right hand, he's holding a picture frame of a man. And who is that man? Nobody really knows. Is that him when he was a younger man? Is that his older father? Is it his grandfather? Is it somebody else? I don't know. And in the far left, you have um, a metal face. So you have three different faces. You have the flesh, the, the flesh face of a man, uh, a painted face, and also a metal face. And if you connect all these three things, they make a nice triangle composition. In terms of how you photograph this, I don't know, but I could imagine, you know, he's trying to take a shot, a portrait of a man in his home, on his bed or his couch or whatever, and he might have wanted to show him the frame, or his, or Kudok was like, let's get some props, and he was placing all these elements. Okay, lay there, hold this uh, frame. Oh, we need something else. Oh, what is that huge metal looking thing? Oh, put that over there. So he's kind of created this triangle. Um, one of his very emotional photos as well. So here, what's what's happened? You have a child that's passed away, two coins over the eyes. I'm not 100% sure, but I believe that um, you know, aroma tradition is that uh, if you put coins over the eyes, it's almost like the, the passage to the underworld or something like that. And in the top right corner, you have a lot of what I believe uh, religious icons. But just look at the expression of the, the grandmother face, the you know, the despair, the sadness, the fact that somebody who's elder has to bury someone who's younger. And the way that her hands are just gently caressing this young girl's face. It's it's a photograph that, you know, it's even very difficult to take this photo of your family. Um, I actually photographed my grandfather's funeral, and it was a very emotional experience for me. And to think of an outsider being able to grab, um, to get enough insider status to make this kind of image is really powerful to me. Another strategy is when you're photographing uh, a lot of people is if you have everyone looking away from you, but one person looking at you, it really draws your attention to that person or vice versa. You have everyone looking at you, one person looking away, it will kind of become not as strong. And in this image, you know, just see the way he's packed the frame full of all these kids all looking away from the camera, totally uh, you know, oblivious. But here you have this little girl, hands or hips looking intently at you and, you know, Think of the, the woman she'll be when she grows up. I think strong, powerful, confident, assertive, uh, maybe a bit sassy, but I think it's that look of the eyes. And there's that saying, eyes are the windows to the soul. And small things I love is the texture of the wall and her hands on her hips. Just a very, very powerful image. Hmm, what's going on here? So a little bit hard to know, but it looks like perhaps a kitchen, but all this black stuff on the walls. It almost looks like blood splatter. But here you have a woman kind of looking over and she looks a little bit happy. She looks a bit like uh, pretty, maybe a bit sexy, who knows? And I think it's that hand gesture and that eyes. And if you think about a painting, what does this woman look like? Or, or who does she look like in terms of the facial gesture and stuff like that? And the name rhymes with Mermir. <laughs> Yeah, so if you think about the Vermeer painting, um, woman with pearl earring. Yeah, kind of, you know, the headband and that look in her face almost mirrors that of this woman here. Just something I found interesting. And I think this is once again a strong thing that just makes strong photos in general. Having that strong eye contact really helps you connect with your subjects more emotionally. Kind of this cool, dark, mysterious man on the far left smoking a pipe and this guy's on the right, bounces the frame. 
And uh, yeah, that's it. So when you're working on street photography projects, ultimately one of the, the biggest things I think you want to work on is um, several things. So we'll just kind of recap them together. Um, first thing is you want to work on them for a long time. So generally, I'd recommend, <laughs> I know this is hard, uh, two to 10 years. So when you're working on a project for a long period of time, it helps you really get a sense of uh, the people, the place, and also helps you a lot in the editing process. I think when you're working on a street photography project, about 90, about 95% of it is editing, meaning um, <clears throat> you want to shoot a lot, but when you create a sort of narrative or create a story, um, the images you decide to keep, the images you s decide to de uh, the ditch, and what order you decide to put on them is dependent on uh, what kind of story you're trying to take, tell. And so if you want to create a good project, I mean, generally the best ones I've seen take two to 10 years. Of course, it doesn't have to. Uh, apparently, there's some photographers who could make a really great project in just a week or two, but I think it just depends on the circumstances and how hard you work. So generally, what I think makes a great project is working on it for a long period of time. Another project is make it personal. Meaning when you're working on a street photography project, think about your personal life experiences. So if you consider yourself an, uh, as an outcast, as a wanderer, uh, like what I think Kudelka perhaps did, he photographed other people who are wanderers and pe other people who are quote, quote, outcasts of society. And therefore using your personal experiences and projecting that on the outside world and also the other people you make, uh, you meet, will make the photo much more unique. And I think the best street photography projects are the ones that show some sort of personality or worldview from um, the photographer. So don't think of trying to photograph what other people would find interesting. Photograph what you think is interesting and photograph in a way which is faithful in, in terms of how you see the world. Also, when you're working on a street photography project, I think um, stay consistent. So with camera, lens, film, etc. I don't think it necessarily has to be. I mean, once again, there there's always exceptions to every single rule. And I don't want to think I don't want to, you guys to think these are quote quote rules. These are simply guidelines. But I think when you're starting off in any sort of creative endeavor, often having more restrictions helps you ha be more creative. So if you think about a haiku poem, a haiku poem that has a very strong, um, strict uh, sentence structure, a certain amount of sentences and a certain amount of syllables from each um, line. It forces you to be more creative and therefore spurs creativity um, by having these sort of restrictions. So if you're working on a project for the first time, try to stay consistent. Use one camera, one lens, one film, or one sort of um, post processing technique or something like that. Also, when you guys are working on um, street photography projects, um, I didn't really talk about this too much, but um, Focus on the sequencing of images. And a way to sequence images, it's more of poetry than it's more of poetry than science. Uh, the best way to study sequencing is uh, I think study films, books, literature, and think of what kind of story you are trying to tell. So if you're working on a project, think about the generally the most important images are your first image and your last image, and think about how the first image is a shot that draws your viewer into the series and how the last series, uh, the last image in the series is kind of a concluding image and how all the photos in between kind of add a certain cadence, rhythm and flow to your images. Also, when you guys are working on um, a street photography project, I mean, there's different types of projects um, out there. So some of them are project types, right? Like sense of place or um, I believe this is called topology, where you're just photographing one type of subject matter. So uh, for Kudelka, it's like his photographing the Roma people or gypsies. Uh, one project I'm working on is my quote, quote, suits project. So I'm only photographing people in suits. And this is another way you could be uh, more focused on your project is only focusing on one sort of certain uh, subject matter. Let's say you're only photographing kids, you're only photographing dogs and or you're only photographing uh, a certain neighborhood. And, you know, maybe it's what you like. Uh, and another one you could do is like kind of a concept. So Martin Parr and his uh, Small World series, it's more of a concept, is that his photographing uh, tourism, and that could be photographed anywhere. Uh, with Sense of Place, you know, you had um, uh, Istanbul photographing America, and the, a lot of these things could overlap, right? Um, Robert Frank's Americans is a sense of place of how he feels like in America, but also it's kind of a concept. What is, quote, quote, America, right? So... 
uh, when you're working on a project, uh, also realize that lots of projects fail. Don't be too rigid. Don't be too rigid. Also be flexible. Meaning when you're working on a project, not every single project that you work on is gonna work out. And oftentimes killing your projects, I think is a good thing, is if you're working on a project that's not really going anywhere, think of how you could edit or modify or change the direction of the project. Um, or think about, you know, um, you know, other people who've done similar projects, get inspiration from them and see what you wanna do similar from them or just similar from them. Um, and another another thing too is, and this start a bit hard, is, don't have pre when you're working on a project i mean this is a little bit difficult is that if you have too much of a strong preconceived notion of what you want to work on so if you're out shooting let's say um you're shooting your neighborhood like, okay i'm only going to shoot pink dogs doing backflips i mean that's a little bit too restrictive in terms of a project and it's too much of a rigid preconceived notion or uh, another classic example is um there's a photographer named um carl de kaiser and I've written a little bit of this on my blog. Um, but Carl de Kaiser, magnum photographer, he photographed Siberian prisons. And before he went to shoot them, you know, everyone thinks of a Siberian prison, you know, gritty black and white, people being sad and miserable. But when he actually went there, he actually found it to be kind of a strange, kind of odd, weird, surreal place, almost kind of like Disneyland. And he ended up shooting in color. So... When you're working on any sort of photography series, also be flexible. Don't be too um, rigid and don't have too many uh, preconceived notions when you're working on a project. Um, also, have fun. <laughs> Remember that uh, when you're working on a project, is you know you want to make it personal, but you want to have a you want it to be fun. Is that if you don't find it to be fun and you don't have a reason to continue uh, working on a project, you're probably gonna not going to be motivated. Um, in terms of motivation, um, um, so another good way to stay motivated. So this is a big problem is when you're working on a long-term project, let's say a few years or whatever, every single photographer, myself included, and all the grades, you always have dips of inspiration where you don't know what direction it's going. So this is a good time to meet other photographers, sit down with them, get feedback and critique on your work, and ask them what direction you think you should take the, the projects. Um, and whether do they think that it's worth taking it, keep, keep continuing, they might just suggest for you to kill it, or they might also suggest projects for you to, um, uh, ways that you could modify the project. And of course, having outside opinions is good in the sense that they have ideas that you might not have. And right, another, th another tip is to stay motivated. I mean, honestly, you're not always gonna feel motivated to shoot, but I think the best solution is just go out and shoot and then the motivation will follow rather than waiting for the motivation and then shooting because you're not always going to be motivated. Motivation isn't like kind of an on off switch. It's something that you have to keep, you know, focus on the process of going out, taking your camera with you and working on a project and the inspiration will, will follow. Um, and also some tips um, when it comes to editing and sequencing your work, I recommend making small like four by six prints, printing them out, uh, putting them on the ground, and this is a good way to mix them up, seeing what kind of images will stick, um, different ways that you could um, uh, pair images. Also, what some famous photographers have done is they have a big cork board and they put it next to their board. They pin up all their favorite photos, and over time, every time before they sleep and before they wake up, they look at their images. The images that are really strong, they keep up. The images they begin to despise, they take off, and sometimes they'll start repinning photos up and down. Um, to kind of get a sense of what makes their best images. Another tip I have is I generally have my photos on my smartphone. So if I meet other photographers for a coffee, either on my iPad or my phone, I'll show them images, ask them which photos I should keep, which ones I should ditch, and ask and I ask, ask uh, people to be brutally honest with your photos to help you, quote, quote, kill your babies. And yeah, another way to stay motivated is look at photo books. So... Look at photo books that are either similar to your project or dissimilar from your project. I also I often find that um, one of the bad things that photographers do when they don't feel motivated or inspired, and you know I fall to uh, this a lot, is that I'll just buy more cameras, equipment, and gear. But you know you'll have a buzz for a week or two, then it'll just kind of go away. Ultimately, uh, looking at I think other great photography, you know of course it's kind of 
influence you, but I think it's going to influence and inform you in a good way. So these are, yeah, just some practical tips of working on street photography projects. Also, if you want to work on street photography projects, Eric Kim street photography project manual. If you also want to learn more about street photography projects, just Google Eric Kim street photography project manual and you'll find <laughs> for free <laughs> the, the street photography project manual, which I put together for free because I love you guys. And yeah, you can just come down here, uh, click the link and yeah, just uh, download a copy. You know, it's a PDF, read it on the plane or whenever you have time. Uh, also you can download the Google doc if that's, if that's better for you or if you just want to kind of read all the text, it's all available for free on the blog. So yeah, uh, thanks a lot guys for, for listening, learning more about um, street photography projects. Um, and if you guys are interested in learning more about street photography projects, of course you could um, check out my upcoming workshops and see where you want to work on a street photography project uh, in person. So yeah, um, and if you guys have any questions, always leave a, a comment or a blog response. And if you guys are watching this, um, and I'm, what I'm also doing is I'm requiring people who attend my street photography project workshops to watch this lecture. So if you're one of my students that are my upcoming workshop and you watch this lecture, please come into class with um, ideas for projects, street photography projects you'll like. And essentially the reason I'm also doing this is that I want to spend more classroom time to actually talk about your projects, to help you edit, feed, uh, give you feedback and critique on your work um, and have these lectures pre-recorded so you could essentially save time and um, yeah, watch them at your own leisure. So anyways, thanks guys for watching. And so as always, you could always send me a tweet, twitter.com slash photo. Send me a tweet, say what's up, um, or just check out my Facebook, Eric and Photography, where I put a lot of fun stuff, and of course my blog, Eric Kim Blog. Uh, and you guys, you can learn about you know street photography lessons, Martin Parr, learn from the masters, equipment, street photography tips, and all that good stuff. So, anyways, uh, thanks for watching, guys, and uh, until next time, peace out.